The other day I was driving downtown, and I don't like getting stuck in traffic. But this particular case, that's exactly what happened. And I, as, as I saw the traffic backing up, it was easy to pick out why the, what the problem was, because there in the middle of the highway was an 18-wheeler. That 18-wheeler was blocking both lanes of traffic as he was trying to back into a driveway and navigate, and was backing into that driveway, a drainage ditch on both sides. You know, that thing looked like to be about 600 feet long and about 45 feet wide, but it, you know, it, it it only had about an inch or two, so it looked like on each side. And with on the very first try, that 18-wheeler went right smack into that driveway, went right up. The, man, I just want to sit there and applaud to them. Because let me tell you something about backing up trailers. I don't believe God ever intended for human beings to back up a trailer. You know, it's absolutely not natural to us. You know, look, everything is backwards. What's left is right. What's right is left. And it, it, it's, it's all, you all, you got to almost turn your brain over to get used to it. I remember the very first time I tried to back up a trailer. We had come back from our honeymoon. We were getting to Jamie's house, her mother's house. We packed up all of our belongings and we rented a uh, little U-Haul trailer to carry it all in. In fact, at that point in time, since we were just starting out, the very smallest trailer was more than, more than enough room. But I got, went to the place, got the trailer, had it hooked up, brought it home, and I was trying to back it into the driveway. Even though I had mirrors on both sides, I couldn't see what was going on back there. And nothing, nothing where it went anywhere where I wanted it to go. I had it in my mind. I pictured it just right. And I'd turn the wheel. And the next thing I know, that, that trailer was sideways. I'd straighten back out. I tried about four or five times. And needless to say, not only was I having difficulty, but I had an audience of everybody who was in the house and probably neighbors out there too, come in and look at this, 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 this exhibition of trying to back up a trailer. They were having a great old time. And I remember finally I just stopped and hooked the trailer and pushed it where I wanted it to go you know it was never supposed to be that way but there are all sorts of there's a numerous things in life that are difficult and rather unnatural that we have to learn to do look it all began real early you remember when you were a five year old trying to run ride a bicycle you know and you might have had your mom or your daddy out there with you trying to hold it and pushing you for a while. And, you know, when they let go, you would just be wobbling all over the place. There's all sorts of things that are unnatural to us and that are difficult. But I believe that one of the, one of the things that we still experience today as adults, that it, it can be difficult and is unnatural, is how we work with God. One of the hardest things that I ever learned or ever tried to learn is how to work with God. Now, look, from an early age, I knew that God wanted me to, uh, to, to serve Him. I knew that God called me to be His servant. He had not called me into the ministry per se yet, but because of the fact that I'd given my heart and soul and life to Him, I wanted to work with Him and I wanted to work for Him. And I, I felt that, that call very, uh, very early. But I knew that he had great marvelous things that he wanted to accomplish. In fact, Jesus says it this way in John chapter 14, verse 12. He said, truly, truly, I say. And by the way, anytime you read in Scripture and it says truly, truly, or if you're reading King James, very, verily, verily, what he's telling you is what's coming next is extremely important. That's a, that's a way of him saying, pay attention. So are you paying attention? He said, truly, truly, I say to you, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also. And greater works than these he will do because I go to the Father. That's what Jesus promised. Okay, do you see the challenge that is there? The works that I do... He will also do. And greater works than these. 
You know, that's a that's a, that's a that, that's coming straight from the from the from the mouth of Jesus Christ when he was here on this earth. But the truth of the matter is, working with God doesn't come doesn't come easy. When it comes to doing God's work, I have some ideas, but are they good ideas? Are they God's ideas? Are my big plans for life? Are my big plans for, for ministry? Are they, are they something that God can support? I have ideas. I have, I have abilities. But the truth of the matter is, can God use my abilities? Or does everything have to be done in the special power of the Holy Spirit? How do I get God's power in my life to carry out the ideas and carry out the abilities? I, I, I wonder, have any of those questions ever come to your mind? And if they have, have you found any answers that satisfy it? Well, the truth of the matter is, there's a little passage in John chapter 5. And if you're not already there, go ahead and turn to John chapter 5, where Jesus tells us the answers to these questions. In these verses, he sets out his own strategy for working with the Father. So turn to, as you turn to chapter 5 of John, the Gospel of John, let me give you a little bit of background about this, the, 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 this passage. Uh, this passage is dealing with where Jesus healed a crippled man at the pool of Bethesda. With this miracle, Jesus stirred up a bunch of trouble for himself because he healed the man and the man picked up his mat and, and walked on the Sabbath day. And the Jewish leaders got very upset with that because of their legalism. It was unlawful to do any work on the Sabbath day. And so, because Jesus had done this, he would, Jesus was uh, uh, in big trouble with the Pharisees and with the other Jews. And when they challenged Jesus about this, this experience, he explained what had taken place at the pool. He gave a simple and clear description of how he had worked in partnership with the, with the Heavenly Father to heal the man. So, with that background in mind, let's look at... Jesus' explanation for the answers that we need to our questions. And we see that beginning in verse 16. John chapter 5, verse 16, read with me. For this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus. Now, now they were very upset. Keep in mind, they weren't rejoicing that the man had been healed. They were very upset because they broke, Jesus broke their rule that you cannot work on the Sabbath. So for this reason, the Jews were persecuting Jesus because he was doing these things on the Sabbath. But he answered them, my father is working until now, and I myself am working. For this reason, therefore, the Jews were seeking all the more to kill him, because he was not only breaking the Sabbath, but also was calling God his own father, making himself equal with God. Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. For the Father loves the Son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the Father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. Now remember, this passage records Jesus' explanation for what happened in the healing of this man at the pool of Bethesda. In essence, what Jesus is doing is giving his methodology of ministry. In other words, he's given us principles for working with the Father. And this morning, I want you to see in these four verses three principles for working, of, of how to work with God. The first principle I want you to see is, is that God involves his servant in his work. God involves his servant in his work. Look at verse 17. This is, this is what Jesus said. He said, My Father is working until now, and I myself am working. He said, in other words, God is at work. And because he's my Father, I too am at work. You know, I can imagine Jesus responding to the man uh, 
I, I just picture him walking through the streets of Jerusalem. He's got some of the disciples with him. Now, you got to keep in mind, he's not acting on his own. He was responding to what the Father was doing. So he's... he's Moving through the crowded streets of Jerusalem, he's very calm, he's very secure, he's, but he's alert to every face. He's alert and, and reading every situation. And so Jesus and the disciples come to the pool of Bethesda. The Bible says it's located by the sheep gate. A large number of, of disabled, diseased, and sick people are gathered by the pool. Uh, some have relatives or friends with them. Some are alone. And Jesus stops at the edge of the, of, the, of, the, of the pool and just observes the scene of what's going on. There's one in particular who seems to catch his attention. A poor, crippled man in shabby clothing. For, uh, it's very obvious this man has been disabled for a very long, long time. And Jesus moves toward that man for a closer look. As Jesus stands over him, the man looks up, hopefully. The disciples draw near to see what will happen next. And Jesus just asks one simple question. Do you want to be healed? Do you want to be healed? The man responds that he has no one to put him in the pool. When the water is stirred, he wants healing. He is in hope. That's why he's there. He's in hope of, of being healed. But every day, he would be at the pool. He'd be as close as he could at the, at, to get to the water. Because he believes what most people believe. He believed that occasionally an angel from heaven would visit the pool and stir the water. And the, 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 the thought was that the very first person who got into the water after the angel stirred it, that person would be healed. But there would only be one. And he said that before he was able, because nobody was there to help him before he's able to get into the water, somebody else would beat him to him. He's, he's saying, yes, I want to be healed. Yes, I am hopeful that I will be healed. I'm just not able to do it. You know what that man is showing? In my opinion, that man is showing faith. And Jesus sees this man's faith. He sees the desperation. He sees the, the hoping against all hope. He sees the helplessness of this man. He, he even knows about all the tears that have accompanied this man's lonely prayers to God. Because in many years he had cried out to God to heal him from this long nightmare of helplessness. In this very brief conversation that he has with this man, Jesus is convinced that the Father has indeed prepared the man for this day and that he's ready to heal him. So he commands, simply just says to the man, I command you, get up and walk. He hasn't walked in decades. And Jesus, seeing his Father at work, Jesus, seeing this man's hope and faith and belief, just simply says, get up and walk. And the man got up and walked. Now, how would you have reacted if you were one of the disciples that had been there on that day? You know? I think if you and I had been disciples that day, first of all, we would have never suspected that Jesus was responding to what he saw the Father doing. We would probably wonder why everybody else wasn't healed there. Because there was a lot of sick people, a lot of disabled people there at the, at, 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 at the side of the pool. Why weren't all those? We, we would probably be wondering, man, we got to figure out a way to franchise this, 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 this thing so it can go all over the nation. We, well, if we can harness this somehow, we'll become rich and famous and powerful. You know, let me ask you a question. Is your strategy for working for God, is your strategy for doing ministry, is it based on what you see the Father is already doing? Is it based on that confidence that God is already working in you, around you? Or are you trying to do some work for God and hope that he in turn will bless it? You know, there's a lot of Christian workers who go into a field with an agenda of work already in mind. 
we don't think we need to wait on God. We don't think we need to watch and listen and see what God's doing. We already know what to do. In fact, for some of us, it never occurs to, to even stop and look for God. And sometimes it works the other way around. One of the most foolish questions that a church pulpit search committee can ask a prospective preacher is when you come here as a preacher, what's the first thing you're going to change? But you know what's even more foolish than that? It's for a preacher to answer it. You know? Because how in the world can you answer that question when you haven't been to that, that church yet to see what God is already doing? Our minds are preoccupied with our plans, with our strategies, with our agenda. That's what we bring with us. But what we need to be occupied with is knowing that the Father is already at work. And we can see where He's working. You know, when we start about trying to do ministry on our own, first of all, we're assuming that we can do His work. We believe that God will involve Himself as long as we're doing something biblical. As long as we're doing something that... Is, is for Him. We assume that our intentions are worthy. We assume that the, that, that the Father is obligated in some way to support our work because we're doing it for Him and we're doing it in His name. Truth of the matter is what I'm trying to say is oftentimes we are just too busy. We get too busy for God. We think of all the things that we have to do, all the things that we want to do, and we don't notice what He's doing. Every once in a while we might stumble up across, stumble across something that He's doing, but most of the time we try to shape what God is doing, and we try to fit God into our image so that He will fit our plans. But the affirmation of Jesus is very clear. He said, my father is always at work. Wherever God takes us, whatever our circumstances, whatever situation we find ourselves in, we need to remember that God is always at work. Also clear in this statement is the relationship of Jesus' own work to the work of the Father. The Father takes the initiative and the Son responds. The, fa the Father always works. The Son also works. Jesus never acted independently of God the Father. He was convinced that the Father was already at work and that His own part was to respond to what the Father was doing. He did not take the initiative, even though he was the Son of God. He participated, but he didn't push his agenda. God has made it his method to use people in his work. But he never, ever, ever allows people to use God. How many times are we guilty of doing just that? Us trying to use God. I'm not going to go into the full story, but you know that I've shared it with you before. Many years ago when I was in the army, God called me into, into preach into the ministry. It, look, his call was just as evident as the sunrise was this morning. I knew that's what he was calling me, but I didn't want to do it. In fact, I found all sorts of reasons not to do it. And I even had started to say the gall, but that's not right. I was stupid enough to tell God what he needed. Out loud! I, I said, God, let me tell you what you need. I'm sure 30-something years later, he's still, he's still laughing over that. Me telling God what he needs. But aren't we all guilty of doing just that? We tell God, here's what you need. God, here's what I'm going to do for you. God, 
Sometimes we will sit there and say, God, this is what I'm going to do, and if it's, your, if it's not your will, you stop me. No, that's not the way it works, church. The Father is always at work, and we need to join Him where He is. This is a great source of encouragement and hope for us. God always has to be in the control position and we always have to be in the support position. And if God is in the control position, then He alone is responsible for the work. He alone is responsible for making the plans, providing the results, or providing the resources and he alone is responsible for guaranteeing the results but we need to make sure every day we live the gospel we need to make sure every day that we speak the gospel but we need to also make sure every day that we leave the results to God we can trust God completely and we can trust him joyfully as he involves us in his great redemptive work. We know that because he is also always at work, we also can work, just like Jesus said. So the first principle of how to work with God is very clear. The Father involves his servants in his work as he himself takes initiative and maintains control. That leads us to the second principle we see in this passage. God limits his servant to his work. Again, look at Jesus' words this time in verse 19. He said, Therefore Jesus answered and was saying to them, to the Jews, Truly, truly, again, something important's coming. Truly, truly, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself unless it is something he sees the Father doing. For whatever the Father does, these things the Son also does in like manner. This is startling admission. I mean, th stop and think, who's saying this? This is Jesus, the Son of God. Jesus, who is God, made human. He said, the Son can do nothing by Himself. What a limitation that the Savior of the world had to accept. The Father never intended for Jesus the Son to strike out on His own. Remember, it was disobedience and distrust on the part of Adam that brought sin into the world. But it is complete submission on Jesus' part which made a remedy for sin and enabled us to be reconciled unto God. Jesus came to reestablish as a man that complete harmony with God which, which had been lost. And he subordinated himself to the Father so that the principle of authority would be reestablished in the world. That was Satan's appeal and his temptations that he, when he tempted Jesus. He, he wanted Jesus to act by himself. He wanted Jesus to act for himself. And you know the, the, the story. G, the devil came to, to Jesus at a time when he was weak, when he was hungry, at the end of 40, day, 40 days of fasting in the, uh, in the wilderness. And he came to him to, to, to tempt him to act by himself and for himself. The purpose of these temptations was nothing more than to break the harmony between Jesus the Son and God the Father. He does exactly the same thing for us. Listen, let me tell you something that's true about Satan. Satan never fears a man doing some great work for God as long as that man is doing it on his own. That's, that doesn't bother him. Satan even, was, was even willing for Jesus to have complete control over the kingdom of the earth as long as he was not under the authority of the Father in doing so. That's what Satan's trying to do in your life. He's trying to get you to act on your own. He's trying to get you to ignore the relationship that you have with God the Father. He's trying to get you to ignore that God has full and complete authority and control over us. Satan doesn't want God involved in anything. But remember what Jesus said. The Son can do nothing by Himself. Only what He sees His Father doing. 
If this was true for the Son of God, how much more true is it for me and you? In fact, Jesus said it this way in John 15. He said, I am the vine and you are the branch. He who abides in me and me and him will bear much fruit. For apart from me, you can do what, church? Nothing. Apart from me, you can do nothing. You know, we're under the impression that we can go take the initiative and that we can do anything which is in keeping with Scripture. We see the will of God as all that the Bible says God intends to do. If some proposed activity is forbidden by Scripture, then we know it's, it's, it's forbidden by God. It's not in God's will. But we also think that we can do anything as long as it's scripturally correct, as long as it's good for the kingdom, as long as it's some good, noble purpose. Not only are we to pray and act according to the intention of God, according to the will of God, but we also are to, to act according to the timing of God for a specific situation. God intends to direct us not only to what we need to do, but when it needs to be done and how it must be done. It, he reserves the authority to himself to determine all these factors. Now, I don't think I'm telling you anything new when I'll let you know. My favorite type of music is classical music. I love listening to classical music. Whether I'm, most of the time, I'm listening to it on by radio or Pandora or one of those. But every once in a while, I like going to the actual symphony. You know, I want you to stop and think about symphony orchestra. I don't know how many people are in an orchestra, 55, 60, 65 people, all playing different instruments. They've got a, a big repertoire of, of music that they play. When they're preparing for concerts, they practice all of the music, all of the selections that the conductor has picked out for the season. But on, all, on any particular night, they're playing only a part of those. Even though we're talking about professional musicians, they can't just go play any song that's in their repertoire they've been practicing and they can't play any particular song any way they want to. They have to follow the lead of the conductor. The conductor picks whatever songs that is going to be going to be played. They have to play at the right time. When the conductor takes that baton in his hand and holds it up so he's got everybody's attention. And then at the downbeat they begin to start playing. And all throughout that throughout that piece he's moving his arms in time with the music Music, and everybody follows along with that conductor. The conductor himself is the only one who is responsible for what is played, how it is played, and when it is played. That's exactly what God is doing. Paul warns us that we must not assume that we are free to launch out on any way that we want to within the bounds of biblical authority. If, just like a musician, if we play anything we want, any time we want, that's not music. That's just nothing more than noise. But when we play what we're, what's, been, what's been selected, and we play it the way it has been selected, and we play our notes when they are to be played, then beautiful music is the result. That's what God's work is all about. If we build on the foundation of Christ, our work will stand the test of judgment. All of the things we try to do on our own, the Bible says is nothing but wood, hay, and stubble, and it'll be consumed in the fire. But what is built on God is the gold and silver and will last for all time. God the Father insists that we involve ourselves only in His work. He is doing the work that He is doing where we are at the time that we are. This partnership with God 
The submission to God means that we forego all our independent initiative. We do not call on God to respond to us. We respond to Him. It is His initiative to do His work. And we are to do it in His time. Only then can we work in harmony with the rest of the body as well. You know, sometimes we doubt that God's at work. We just don't see it. We look around what's happening in our society today. We, we, read, we turn on the news, whether you listen to that on a, one of the news broadcasts, whether you turn to cable or whether you turn to an internet or podcast, no matter how you hear the news, we oftentimes wonder, is God in control? We, we sometimes doubt that he's working at all. But the truth of the matter is, he is at work. And he wants to, us in, to involve us in his work. And he will involve us in his work only if we abandon any hope of trying to get him to, to use him in a means to accomplish our, our efforts. So we have seen that the Father involves us in his work and that he limits us to his work. But there's a third principle for how to work with God. And the third work principle is, is that God shows his servant his work. Look again at what Jesus said in verse 20. He said, for the father loves the son and shows him all things that he himself is doing. And the father will show him greater works than these so that you will marvel. It's obvious that we cannot be consciously involved in the work of God if we cannot see it. But God is a God of revelation. He wants to show his servant where he's at in the world. You know, this is what I call the burning bush principle. Just as Moses' attention was stopped, God got the attention of Moses by a burning bush. We can see the burning bush sign of God at work in our lives. You know, imagine the difference in the story of Moses and the story of Israel if Moses himself had ignored that burning bush. He looked over and he saw that bush. It was on fire, but it was not being consumed. Suppose Moses would have responded something like this. Man, would you look at that? I ain't never seen anything like that at all. But strange things do happen from time to time. I'd like to go check it out, but there's so much I got to do. There's so many repairs that got to be done around the tent. I got these sheep to take care of. There, there's, I, I just don't have time. I can't imagine what that burning bush means, but it's getting late. I better hurry up and get home for supper. You know? We get too busy. We don't see what God is doing. Let me ask you a question. And I'm being in all seriousness. Are you too busy to stop and see your burning bush? God is trying to involve you in His work. He's limiting you to His work, but He's showing you where He is working. Are we too busy to stop and see the burning bush? Our schedules are packed with all sorts of important tasks. We're planning, we're doing reports, we're setting goals, we're making an agenda, we're, we're, we're doing all sorts of things. We've got all these things already scheduled out for the rest of today and tomorrow, and we just don't have time. But remember that burning bush. God spoke to, to Moses through that bush. First thing he said, to remove your shoes, for this is holy ground. Are we too busy to stop and see our burning bush? God wants to involve you in his work. He wants you to see what he's doing. And so he sets a burning bush on fire so that we will see it and that we will respond to it. He is inviting us 
to join Him where He is working. He is inviting us to draw near. David writes in Psalm 27 verse 14, Wait for the Lord, be strong and take heart, and wait for the Lord. How good are you at waiting? I'm going to be honest with you, I'm not very good at it. I hate you having to go to a doctor appointment at 2 o'clock and wait for 25, 35, 40, 45 minutes and then get, the doctor will see you now. And that, all that means is they're going to take you back to the back, they're going to put you on the scales, they're going to take your blood pressure, and then you're going to sit there another 25 or 30 minutes for the doctor to get there. I'm not very good at it. I don't know if they got cameras in those rooms or not, but if they do, they can see that I'm getting very, very frustrated. Well, I don't know if the nurses or doctors can see me getting frustrated in that, in that room. But I do know this. My Heavenly Father sees my frustration when I have to wait down here. Yet, David tells us, wait for the Lord. Be strong and take heart and wait for the Lord. There are promises to those who wait on the Lord. And the most famous of these promises we find in Isaiah 40, verse 31. Those who wait on the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and should be and not be faint. Wait on the Lord. It takes courage to wait for the Lord. It takes, it, it calls for a deeply held conviction that only in waiting for, for Him will we see His hand at work. Only in seeing Him at work will we be able to become involved in that work. And only as we become involved in that work will we bear fruit. And only when we bear fruit will be that God, it will remain to His glory when God Himself is the one who produces the fruit. You know, all of this leads me back to John chapter 6. In John chapter 6, the Jews came to Jesus and they asked a question. Now remember, in chapter 5, they're trying to kill him. They're trying to they're persecute him because he violated their, their, their interpretation of the Sabbath. <coughs> But in John chapter 6, they come and they ask one question. How can we do the work of God? How can we? Do? It's an important question. Have you asked that question? How can we do the work of God? And in verse 29, John, uh, Jesus answered that question. And Jesus said, the only way you can do the work of God is to believe in the one he has sent. Our faith is to be in the presence and the reality of Jesus Christ in the church, in our lives, and in the world. But the truth of the matter is, He's alive, and He's here, and He is at work. He is faithful, and even to this day, He is doing what He promised to do. We are His people. We are His ambassadors. We are agents for doing His work. We are His voice for expressing His thoughts and words. We are His hands to affect the world according to His will. We are His body to, to be His physical presence in the world. We often pray, let us be the hands and feet of Jesus. But do we really mean that? Do we let God control the work that is done through us? God will make tangible. God will make material what is now only spiritual and supernatural. You know, in his book, Eternity in Their Hearts, Anthropologist Don, uh, Don Richardson gave a striking account of missionaries as they went to the different mission fields that they'd been called to. They said that even among the most primitive tribes, when they got there, they found out that God was already at work. They were welcomed 
Most of, the, most of the times, when they get there, they were welcomed. As the ones that God had promised to for a long, long time, He was going to send. What they find out is they didn't come to start the work of God. They came to continue the work of God. They came to join God where He was already working. The missionary's role was not to get something started in the remotest places on earth. It was not to get something something done for the fulfillment of, of what they wanted to do, but rather it was for God to be glorified and for, and for them to carry out and fulfill what God had already started. In other words, God had made His light shine in the darkness, and there they were was to come to show and share with them the light of God. That's exactly what God's called us to do as, as a church. As Faith Fellowship, He's called us to go into the community and here in North Chawan and be the light that this county needs. Rather than thinking that we must do the work of God if anything is to be done, we need to realize that God is already at work around us. That God has invited us to join Him. And that our role, our only role, is to be available. Someone once said, the only ability which you need to have to be a missionary for God is your availability. Ours is to listen, to learn, to probe for signs of His presence. Ours, our responsibility is to search for that holy ground that He calls us to. Our responsibility is to stop and listen, wait upon God and listen to what He says as He speaks to us through the burning bush. You and I can work with God. We can become involved in His work. But we must do it His way. God loves us. And God wants us to join us. And God, because of the fact He does love us, because of the fact that He has invited us to join Him in His work, now we are all at a crisis point. We have to decide what are we going to do. When God speaks, what you do next reveals what you truly believe about God. Is He your Father? Are you His son or His daughter? Are you His servant? And are you going to make whatever adjustment needs to be made in your life so that you can join Him where He is? So that His work is done. And so that He is glorified. And that is how we work with God. Let's pray. Father God, we know that You've called us not just to be saved, not just to be redeemed, but you've called us to be your servant. And because of the fact that you did redeem us, because of the fact that you sent your son to, to die for us and to pay our penalty and to reconcile us unto you, then all we want to do is live for you. We want to work for you. We want you to be glorified. So, Father, we pray that you will show us where you are working and that you will enable us to make whatever adjustment we need to make in our life so that we can join you where you are. Lord, it's not about us. It's all about you. The work that we do is not for our glory. It's not for our reward. It is for your glory. And it is for your name's sake. But Father, we rejoice that you don't keep us in the dark. You involve us in your work. You limit us to only your work. And you show us you, you at work. Now may we be obedient and respond. 
For you are the potter. We are the clay. You are the vine. We are the branch. And we can bear much fruit if only we stay attached to the vine. For as your son Jesus said, apart from you, we can do nothing. But through you, nothing is impossible. Will you do a mighty work in us and through us? For this is our prayer in your name. Amen. You know why God wants you to join Him in His work? You know why He shows you His work? Because He loves you. And how do we know He loves you? Because He sent His Son to die on the cross for you. What does God owe me? Absolutely nothing. But what do I owe God? Everything. Everything.